Obviously. <laughs> I'm, I'm your host, James Zimmerman. Grant and I were already talking before the right when the show started, so I'm a little bit flustered here. But we, <laughs> we had part one where we were talking about the idea of purpose through the lens of Rick Warren and his book, The Purpose Driven Life. But in this second half now, what we want to do is talk about, d delve further into some of the rebuttals, some of the books that Grant actually does recommend that a person read especially if they're wondering what sort of meaning maybe their life has or what they should do with their life. So I will just start right in. Well, we already talked about why doing a program on reason. but um, So in the last program, I asked you about some of the rebuttals, and you mentioned Robert Price. But let's yes. talk a little bit more about him, because we just touched on it real, right. real quick. Why don't right. we uh, give maybe an overview of his book and then say why it's uh, like an antidote to Rick Warren's. Well. In, in terms of the, the, the setup, in terms of why, why a reason, and this is the book, The Reason Driven Life by Robert Price, uh, I think it's a remarkable book. I have a bias. Okay. And it's, in quoting him, he said, in response to Rick Warren, you will not have missed the pun on Rick Warren's title we often use the words purpose and reason pretty much as synonyms. What is the purpose of law? What is the reason for that rule? Tell me the reason for your action, and I will tell you the purpose of mine. But there is a subtle difference. A purpose can denote a guiding aim, as it does in Warren's Purpose Driven Life, but a reason-driven life denotes a life lived by means of rational thinking and choosing. A truly human life must be reason-driven. Uh, that sums up his book in a, in, in, in a nutshell, because it, it tells you that he's counterpointing the ideas of Rick Warren, and he's also promoting the idea of through that by using reason. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so what's uh, Price's background? Now here we get into an interesting thing, okay. because <laughs> Is he a mystery? He's a mystery. <laughs> no, he's not a mystery. He's Rick Warren's brother in a very strange way because they both start out as Baptists. Oh, okay. As fundamentalists. He started out going to Mont Montclair State University, so it was a public university. That may be where he was corrupted. I'm not sure. Then he goes to the Gordon Cowell Theological Seminary and he has his training. Uh, in, in background of, as a seminarian. And then he goes to Drew University and he completes two PhDs. One of them was in New Testament studies and one was in systematic theology. And then he goes out and he's a Baptist minister for a while, as I understand. So he has something in common with, with Rick Warren. He, he really understands where Rick's coming from or going to, depending on your point of view. Uh, at the present time, he is a professor uh, and teaches at the Johnny Coleman Theological Seminary. He also is associated with the Council for Secular Humanism as a professor of biblical criticism. And so he gets around into a variety of, yeah. of circles. He has written extensively. Uh, one of the few authors that I've met and, and, and interviewed where he has a long list of books, and they're not all on the, on, on the study of religion, but those on religion, deconstructing Jesus, is Jesus dead? The inerrant, inerrant the wind, his, his use of strangeness yeah. with words, which is about the evangelical crisis in biblical authority. He has one called the case against the case for Christ <laughs> and the amazing colossal apostle, which is the search for the historical Paul. He is also a scholar in the area of some science fiction or fantasy with H.P. Lovecraft. Oh, okay. He's a, he's a devotee of this writer. I'm not, but he is. And so he, he, he covers a, a broad spectrum of, of ideas in, in literature and is, an, is quite an amazing person himself in the interview and talking to him. So he couldn't resist doing this book. Uh, in direct response to Rick Warren. And as you get into the book, you understand why he had to do this in, 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 in writing it. 
When I first approached it, it was reminiscent of two books that I read as a freshman in college, and they're both by Walter Kaufman. Kaufman wrote The Faith of a Heretic, What Can I Believe, How Should I Live, What Do I Hope? This was my early introduction to humanism, in mm -hmm. a sense. And within a couple years, this also was published, Critique of Religion and Philosophy by Walter Kaufman. And I became a faithful advocate for Walter Kaufman after that. He was a philosopher and uh, taught philosophy and also studied religion and taught religious uh, subject matter. And when, that, when I first encountered Robert Price and the Reason Driven Life, I immediately thought of Walter Kaufman and the influence I'd had uh, by him at, at, at that time. Um, when you open this book of Robert Price's and you read something like this, Rick Warren's super best-selling book, The Purpose Driven Life, is apparently meeting a great spiritual hunger among the Americans these days. People, it would seem, want purpose. He does not extol the notion of living according to some chosen purpose. He has a very particular one in mind. For Pastor Warren, the purpose of all human lives is to be a fundamentalist Christian. <laughs> And so what's his view on fundamentalism then? Well, he has a very ne negative view of, yeah, of fundamentalism. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in a sense, this is a response. He says, nor are you likely ever to arrive at some definitive truth by following Rick Warren sure. and the evangelical movement. Your thinking about the meaning of life will be an ongoing project if you go with reason. It's o that is its own reward. And the conclusions you do reach will be tentative and always open to revision in light of new insights you may encounter. It would be I would be delighted if the Reason Driven Life helped you in that process. And you can do it in 40 chapters <laughs> or 40 days. Yes. <laughs> so do you think they're, the perspectives that each of these two men are bringing to their book kind of govern the approach they're taking? I guess, uh, what am I trying to say here? That. Um, because they've had such different backgrounds in the most recent years of their lives, then their books are just kind of trying to steer people towards their own current understanding? Well, when he attacks the evangelical movement and, and shows the difference between where he was and where he wants people to go, in a sense, okay, yeah. and, and helps them, he is saying that, first of all, People that are in the evangelical movement tend to get wrapped up in activity that is religious-based. Uh, now, Jehovah's Witnesses are not traditionally called fundamentalist Christians, but in reality, they are, if you want to be unbiased about it. And they're very much involved in their activity. And as he said, they do it at the sacrifice of living their lives fully, because everything is wrapped yeah. up in that. And when you're in that, if you're in the fishbowl, everything looks wonderful. It's only when you get on the outside that you see this activity has taken over everything you do, and you don't think for yourself anymore. You live in a system that promotes the self and yet denies the self. It's a contradiction that you're constantly having to fight. You have something that you believe that is the voice of God, because it comes through the Bible, but it really comes through the filter of a denomination, whether it's a Baptist denomination, a Jehovah's Witness denomination, a Catholic denomination, it doesn't matter. It's going through a filter before yeah. you get it. That's when I, uh, a friend of mine said, well, I want to belong to a Bible-based church. Really? <laughs> Which translation? Yeah. Let's start with that one. Doesn't really narrow it down. <laughs> uh, evangelical thinking fosters an immature mind because it essentially says, you need daddy. You need God to direct your life in all matters. You don't make up your own mind. You go to the Bible for the answer. And somehow or another, you will find it there. Uh, people do not understand that in reality, they're seeing the answer that they want. They read it into the text quite often. 
And because of the demands that, that religion often make on these people, uh, you will see them experience depression and anxiety. Now, they, the studies show that this, is, that this happens quite frequently in fundamentalist groups. But fundamentalist groups will deny it in discussing it. But it is there. So what do, when we look at um, Price's book, yes. what are some critiques that have been put forth about his book then? Well, the critique that, that comes at his book, it was amusing. I, I read a, a critique by an evangelical who said, it is a book he would advise every evangelical to read because it will open their eyes and make them think. Oh, okay. That's not really a critique. Against no, the book. well, you see, that criticism doesn't necessarily have to be negative. True, yeah. And it was a positive form of criticism. Yeah. Uh, there are others that dismiss him because he is way out in left field in terms of theology. He's an ultra liberal in his thinking in terms of theology. Uh, here's a man who raises the question did Jesus actually exist? He is the person who translates books of the Bible that are pre Nicene and has his own pre Nicene uh, New Testament. <laughs> yeah. he, he challenges all the very basic premises of Christianity and the existence of certain elements of that. Uh, he is not a person who is inside the box. He is definitely working outside the box or outside of the fishbowl and poking at it and saying, these things simply can't add up. They don't add up. And if you continue down this road, it influences how you think. I think that's, that's one of the important parts also of understanding uh, when you become an evangelical or if, you're, if you happen to be reared in the evangelical tradition that it influences how you think. You're no longer an independent thinker. Mm -hmm. You think only in terms of the conformity of the denomination you belong to. You may, in fact, have directives that say, do not read anything but what, yeah, we, but what publish. we publish. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's not safe. You might start to think that would be dangerous. Uh, you conform to a, a standard that is created by the group. So again, uh, it might influence how you dress. It's going to influence your way of life, your choices of books that you would read, movies that you would attend. And you, it is a filter process that's put into your brain. And everything is dictated by that filter, even if you're not aware of it. It's there, in, in, in put into your brain by the denomination you belong to. Um, and you are taught that if you encounter a denominational thought which is contrary to yours, it's heretical. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're an apostate mm -hmm. if you believe something that's different than mine. And I couldn't possibly have even a kernel of truth. Uh, we were talking earlier about why people leave a particular organization. And it isn't because the organization is wrong or they're false or something like this. It's because you... Yeah, are in some way defective. Yeah, yeah. you're defective. Yeah. <laughs> that's why you left. Yeah. You probably are a great sinner and you don't want to admit yeah, it. Let, me, yeah. let me take your confession now and we'll heal you. And, and I think one of the most reprehensible things that happen, and they don't see it as, as, as a, a, a reprehensible activity, and that is taking advantage of friendships or family relationships in preaching to you because they want to save oh, yeah. you mm -hmm. from yourself, I guess. And bring you into the flock so you'll be one of them and share in their joy. So there is another book too that offers a response to Rick Warren. I gotta keep all these titles straight. So Robert <laughs> Price's was The Reason Driven Life, but Dan yes. Barker wrote The Life Driven Purpose. Right, right. So with our remaining time here, why don't we, how about an overview of that book? Okay. <laughs> uh, Dan Barker uh, has written couple books, Losing Faith in, in, in Faith, Godless, and The Good Atheist. This is the most recent book, okay. The Driven Purpose. And, and again, it is a response to Rick Warren. Uh, his background uh, has a degree in religion, uh, was a, an ordained minister, was an evangelical fundamentalist preacher at one time. So he has that in common mm -hmm. with our good friend Rick Warren. Uh, he's also a musician. 
And I think it, it, we, we need to know, it's something like 200 songs. He has written musicals that are still out oh, there and available. Yeah. Uh, so he's, he's quite a character. And he is the co-founder of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, which is very, very active mm -hmm. in separation of church and state, or government and, st and state. Uh, and as a co-host of the Freedom, or the Free Thought radio program, uh, and probably, possibly a podcast comes out of that. The oversight of the book. Chapters one and five are really connected chapters because... Wait, does he have 40 chapters in here? No. Oh, he only has like five. Weird. There's nothing spiritually wrong. significant about that at all. <laughs> okay, so anyway, <laughs> chapters one and five, which are the first and the last chapters? The first and the last. Okay. The first deals with purpose and the last deals with meaning. But as he states, they are so related. Uh, when he gets to that last chapter in chapter five and he says, should have put a bookmark in here. He states, meaning comes before purpose. The relationship between meaning and purpose is like the relationship between ethics and morality. It is a difference between theory and practice. Ethics and morality deal with behavior while meaning and purpose deal with intention. Meaning is the theory. Purpose is the practice of intentionality. So one works with the other rather closely. And to determine purpose, you'd almost start out, obviously, with meaning. And then you can, you can come back and say, with purpose, it is the one r that is relevant to living beings. Purpose is striving for a goal, an intentional aiming at a target. And that's what he wants people to understand from his book, oh, yeah. that it is not you the object, but you the thinker, the person who looks forward to things. So that's the, those two chapters. Chapter two deals with morality, and it is very closely aligned with a book by Sam Harris, The Moral Landscape. Mm -hmm. uh, Sam Harris doesn't use this particular formula, but, but it, 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 is, it leads one to understand the same kind of uh, approach as Harris had. His approach is this to morality. He said, on one shoulder you have instinct. On the other shoulder you have the law. And in the middle you have reason. These are your three minds. And that that's how you derive what is right and what is wrong. Now, something that is instinctual, and he gives the example of uh, in, in line, I think it was at an airport, and a child was falling out of a carriage and he caught the child. Okay, yeah. He said, I didn't sit and think about, should I do this or shouldn't I do this? Yeah. He said, I did it instinctually because he believes that people are altruistic at heart and you do it because you want to save the life or mm -hmm. prevent the child from hurting himself or herself. So now you have that part which is instinct. You can look at it in terms of a law which can be derived from that and you do it through reason. So the three work sort of synergistically. Tandem, yeah. Right. And what is the guiding principle? He said, humanistic morality is the attempt to avoid or lessen harm. It is the only real morality because it's human values in the natural world. People should be judged by their actions, not their beliefs. Actions speak louder than faith. And this is, to me, a statement that you would find in Sam Harris's book on the moral landscape. So are there some critiques of Barker's book? Well, because it's rather recent. Oh, okay. Harder to find stuff. <laughs> Harder to find yeah. negatives about it and criticism. Uh, I suspect because of the way he is writing and because he's associated with the uh, Freedom From Religion Foundation, he will have criticism at himself. Oh, sure. More than Most even the book the itself. Content, yeah. Right. They will reflect on that. Now, the other chapters that are in this book, one which deals with the fundamentalist mindset, where he again goes back to something Rick Warren had said, um, he's very critical of it, and he says, to believe that there is just one purpose of life is to deny the joyful dimensions of our existence. It turns us into robots. To live as a slave is dreary and depressing. To live free is bright and exciting. 
Both have their challenges, but only freedom gives you the chance to truly live and grow, to taste the variety of experiences, to hear the rich harmonies and see all the colors of the rainbow. So that's his take yeah. on why you shouldn't be a fundamentalist. Does he make a connection between when you're in <coughs> prayer on your knees with your hands together? That's very similar to a slave shackled. And it is. Now on his knees. I he, think he mentions that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that it. That it is. Everything that is involved, in a sense, with with the rituals of, of Christianity, regardless of the denomination, tend to be that of the slave to the master. Yeah. And oftentimes the master standing right in front of you. Watching everything. Watching yeah. everything. He's called the minister. He's he, the good shepherd, you know. So which book do you think does a better job, or a more effective job at pointing people towards reason over faith? Oh, now you're asking me to really be critical. I am, yeah. If, if you like an anecdotal approach to subject matter, then Dan Barker is your man. Okay, that's like he does in the book Godless as well. Yes. Yeah. He, and I gave you an example of the child falling. Right, yeah. And he does a lot of that, okay. references to things that have happened in his life. And most of it is personal, so it's almost autobiographical, anecdotal kind mm -hmm. of material. If you like that approach and like those stories that are spotted throughout the book, then you will like this book a lot. If you don't like that kind of style of, of writing, and I'm not as fond of that, and it's probably because I'm more of an academic, okay. mm -hmm. then the reason-driven life is probably going to appeal to you because it is much more based on the ideas that are found in books okay. mm -hmm. and not as much, you don't find Price talking about his instincts okay. or yeah. his personal mm -hmm. journey as much. It is, it is much more academic in its approach to things. So we have about five minutes left, but I wanted to uh, talk about the correlation between doubt and reason as kind of like a mirror of the first part of the program where we talked yes. about doubt and faith. Yes. So, Because when you, when, you, when you think about it, doubt is the very basis of science. You, the person who's going to discover something starts in an, in an element of doubt, wondering about something. And reason is then caught up in it because you have to create a structure and reason gives you that structure of understanding. So the relationship is very strong and what comes out of doubt and reason is not certainty but more doubt and more reason. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that it, as, as uh, uh, all of the, the, the modern atheists thinkers in this area, philosophers would say, it is, it is the very nature of, of science, of reason, philosophy, to want to move into the unexplored territory of the mind, of the moon, wherever, yeah. but it is always pushing you forward into what you don't know as opposed to what you do know. Um, do you think that Barker and Price, their journeys, I guess, you know, um, Price doesn't talk about his own personal journey as much in his book, but do you think it's right. one that other free thinkers in the area could relate to or people having doubts in their religion? Well, I think that's, that's one of the key points that you have three people here that have very common backgrounds and they end up in a journey which leads them to something else. Sure. Which leads me to this book, <laughs> Deliverance at Hand. This is a book that was written by James Zimmerman and it's a remarkable book because it shows his journey. It talks about his journey. And it is personal, and it isn't as anecdotal as Barker, but it has a lot of personal things in because that's what the book was aimed yeah, at. Mm -hmm. And it shows this journey from faith to reason. It shows a journey from a fundamentalist mindset, the closed and the release from those shackles, and an opportunity to see things from science and in life and experience those things. And it started with doubt, yeah. as I know. Mm -hmm. And that pushed you forward and freed you from that little box. I agree, yeah. <laughs> that you were in. It's called the great leap of reason as opposed to faith. Great leap of faith, sure. <laughs> yes. All right, well, thank you for mentioning my book. And then I, I know you had one other, and was it Dr. Krause's? Yes, well, and, and it ties in with uh, chapter four of, of uh, oh, Barker's Oh, yeah, we book, have a few minutes if you want which, to mention which, uh, yeah, I like to plug this book. Too. Okay. <laughs> Chapter four of, of Barker's book deals with how 
nothingness is 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 the basis sure, of sure the idea of dividing by zero and yeah yes <laughs> and, and it's it, it it is a nice introduction to the idea but if you really want to get into the depths of it then you pick up Lawrence Krauss's book which is a universe from nothing and maybe this will answer the mystery for you or it will confuse you more I don't know because it depends upon if you follow and read it through carefully and, and come to an understanding of what Krauss is trying to say. But it, it certainly picks up on yeah. what Barker has to so say. So it sounds like you're a it. fan of all four books. It just depends on the style. It depends, <laughs> yes, it depends on the style. Do you want something very academic, very scientific? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, and, and yeah, I like, I'm an eclectic person when it comes to reading. And if you want to sit down and have just sort of a casual conversation with somebody, then you're with Dan Barker. Mm -hmm. If you want to think a little bit more and, and sort of have a, a tongue-in-cheek approach to reason, you have Robert Price. Price. Yeah. And if you want to really scratch your head, you have Lawrence Krauss to help you. And if you want to just sit down and watch how somebody changes their life, you have James Zimmerman. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so what, what's next for Rick Warren, tying back to him? It, what is next for Rick Warren? Good question. He's at an age where he could retire. I would hope that that would happen. Uh, but here is a person who, and, and this is an example of how rigidity steps in with, with that kind of thinking. When you are content mm -hmm. and you have certainty, you don't have to look any place. Yeah. You know that your message is always going to be right. You never have to question it. So you it. think not much change? I think not much change. What about Price? He will continue to explore and expand and question every idea that's out there that is, is related to religion. And Dan Barker will do the same. Uh, Dan engages in a, quite a few debates yeah, mm -hmm. uh, on campuses. He talks about that a couple times in his book. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. He's, he, he has done a lot of debating. Robert Price also has engaged in debates. Um, in, in a variety of places. But he doesn't do it as much as, I don't think, as, as Barker has. All right. Well, I think we put images and titles of the books up on the screen for our viewers who might be interested in yes. more. And again, thank you for your time, for coming here and thank talking you. to us about reason and purpose and faith, <laughs> the intersection of all those things. And thank you for watching and for, or for listening to our show. If you'd like to learn more about Minnesota Atheists, the, the group that sponsors this show, then we'd ask you to contact us on the number or address that we put on the screen. We will be happy to send you a copy of our newsletter so you can find out about all of our events in the area so that you can learn more about us. If you have something that you'd like to see discussed on this show, please contact us. We'll be happy to discuss it if it fits in with our general themes and topics, because if you're interested in us, we're interested in you. Thank you.